chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. And I need y'all to pay attention to what God is telling the king to do. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. I want to teach this morning the peaceful child of God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I thank you for the words that you've laid on my heart. I pray that I'm able to deliver it your way, Lord, that it's your message. Speak to it, Lord. Teach us and make us better, God. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Anybody catch that? I, I said peaceful. He was given a commandment to kill everything that breathed. Even that precious baby back there. If Tate was here, he would be on the, list, the hit list. Nobody would be exempt. And that is what God was telling the king to do. There's a great debate among modern preachers today, and I'm sure it's among everyone, but I know particularly the preachers like to argue about it, and it's over the enlistment of active duty. You know, I served seven years proudly in the United States Navy. My dad was in the Marine Corps. My, my grandfather was in the U.S. Navy. My uncle and my aunt were in the Marine Corps. Uh, it's safe to say that I'm patriotic and I come from a veteran ran family, okay? I mean, military is what I was familiar with and it's what I'm okay with. So obviously, I make no bones about it. My view is slanted. But there are those that I'm very close with and they hold what's called, they want to be an a conscientious observer. They, they claim that it is against their, their religious belief to go into a service that requires them to pull a trigger and take the life of another. And I don't mind someone valuing life. But here's where the debate comes in. They say it's against their, their scruples because the Bible says thou shalt not kill. They believe it's a violation to take care of and that's how they would challenge it. And I've been attacked and because of that. Not only did I serve, but I'm still pre I will talk you into serving if I think that's best for you. Military is not for everyone, but it is for more than you think. But what I tell people is that the Bible says God hates the shedding of innocent blood. If God really said, and if he really meant it literally, thou shalt not kill then you better not go hunting in October, in November, <coughs> in December. Oh, Brother Mike, you got to speak in context. Oh, so why do you draw a line in context there, but not here, when I'm telling you the difference between innocent blood and all blood? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. People get upset about the death penalty. It was started by God. Capital punishment is in the law. If God really wanted no gray area, all black and white, thou shalt not kill, then he is very contradicting of himself. I'm not here to, to defend killing someone. I'm here to attack a mindset today. Because again, I have... I have no problem with folks who value a life. I get it, okay? I do have a problem with folks that are hiding their cowardice under the name of valuing a life. If truth be known, they're really just spineless, gutless cowards. But it's easier to say, oh, I value a life. I'm going to attack the cowards today. Joshua 1, excuse me, let me clarify. If you hold the, the belief that you should not join the service for this belief, I'm not saying you're automatically a coward. 
I'm talking about the people that are hiding their cowardice under that, that umbrella. But Joshua 1 and 9, God says, have, I, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Their choices were either be strong and of good courage or be afraid. One or the other. There is no in-between. I don't have a problem with people who never served. It, it didn't fit in their lifestyle. That's fine. I do have a problem with people who refuse to let their kids enlist. That's cowardly. To think that your kid is better than my kid. To think that I, my life is worth dying for the country, but not your precious baby. That is selfish, and you're a horrible person, and you need to repent, and now I'm feeling my blood boil. Now, I got a problem with, oh, someone else can go sign up. For Somebody has to do the job. If everybody kept your mindset, not my baby, then we would fall prey to anybody that wanted to take us, because nobody had the guts to stand up for this country. But somebody has to stand up. And do what has to be done. And the same thing goes in the church. We've got folks that don't want to get involved because they're gutless and they're cowardice. But they don't mind somebody else getting their hands dirty. They don't mind somebody else taking the risk and going downtown and working with the, the city council, working with the, the soup kitchen, whatever may be done. Let somebody else get involved. But as for me and my house, we will be cowards. i got a problem with thinking, not my baby. So, I think what happens a lot of times, not every time, some families are more well off financially than others. And you've got some kids who've never had to work for anything a day in their life. Some of them, despite the silver spoon, are still good kids. But more times than not, you've seen it, they don't have an appreciation for their vehicle that they were given at 16 because they never had to work for it, and they wreck it because they're doing reckless things in it, and they don't care because mom and daddy's going to buy them another one. We've seen it, right? The same thing goes in anything. I've noticed that the family who has never served, and again, I'm not pointing, I'm just, I want to tie this in here in a second, just, just bear with me. The family who has never served cannot relate to the pains of war. Because you don't appreciate, because it didn't cost you anything. The freedoms, listening to the idiots talk about the vaccination. You know, the, the politicians are literally saying with their own mouth, we need to use this vaccination as leverage to give them their freedoms back. The only people who would be willing to trade their freedoms for a vaccination shot are somebody who has never had to fight for their freedom to begin with. Somebody who hasn't lost a loved one fighting for that freedom. Somebody who had it given to them like a spoiled brat and just don't appreciate it. So the citizen who has never served cannot relate to the pains of war because it never really affected them. If, if daddy didn't come home with a flag, you don't know. If you didn't grow up with your dad going away on deployment or your brother on deployment, eh, you just don't understand what it's like. It's, not, it's just a story that you hear about someone else going through. Other countries are not as blessed as the United States, and the wars are fought on their country, and they understand whether, even if they don't have a family, they've got destroyed buildings sitting right there, they can appreciate the effect of war. We don't have that problem. So we are spoiled to peace. John Stuart Mill was an English philosopher in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And he has one of my favorite quotes of all times. So and I'm going to give you the beginning and the ending of it because it's a long paragraph. He says, War is an ugly thing, but not the ugliest of things. The decayed and degraded state of moral and patriotic feeling, which thinks that nothing is worth a war, is much worse. A man who has nothing which he is willing to fight for, nothing which he cares more about than he does his own personal safety, he is a miserable creature who has no chance of being free unless he is made and kept so by the exertions of better men than himself. If I don't have something worth fighting for, 
if the only thing important to me, the most important thing to me is my safety and my family's safety, the, the not my baby family, okay, oh, you can go to war, but not my family, then the only chance I have of being made free is if someone better than me goes and fights for me and continues to fight for me. That's what he's saying. I want to know if we have something worth fighting for today. And if you do, then you have to understand that not all war is bad. Not all violence is bad. In our society today, they don't teach that. They're teaching you against confrontation. They're teaching you against that. And, and, and some of us are buying it hook, line, and sinker. We really, we put these bumper stickers on our cars saying coexist. I hate to tell you, not every denomination is right. I don't care what's on the sign. I care what's in the heart. But not every pulpit is preaching truth. It takes more than just a sinner's prayer to make it to heaven. You have to be willing to confront the untruth. If you don't, then your kids will fall for it. anything. Some of us don't have the guts to be an actual child of God. If we just don't have the guts to do what God has called us to do. We like to tag peaceful. I'm, I'm non-confrontational. Okay, Dee, my hands are like this. I'm not mocking you. I promise you. I realize that you may be taking it personal when I look at some hands. Oh, I just want everybody to get along. I'm going to win them with love. Love is required. But you don't win wars with love. God never once came in and fought the battle with love. Not one time did he destroy their enemy or cause the enemy to change their feelings from hatred to love. There's a quote that I read. I've been chewing on this. I guess that's why I'm a little passionate about it. I've been chewing on it for a year now. This quote says, you cannot... Truly call yourself peaceful unless you are capable of great violence. If you aren't capable of violence, you aren't peaceful, you're harmless. Important distinction. Man, that's true. If you're just a wimp who can't hurt a fly, you're not peaceful. You're being peaceful because you don't have the guts to do anything because you know if you raise your hands, you're going to get thumped. When Jesus woke up from the storm and calmed the seas, he wasn't harmless. He had all the power in the world. And he spoke with authority. It's the cowards who are sleeping in the storm because they don't have the power to do anything about it. And the problem I have today is there's too many so-called child of God serving in our Lord's army and the Bible says to endure thy self-hardness as a good soldier of Christ. So we are in the Lord's army, and we're cowards. We're harmless. We couldn't hurt the devil if we wanted to. We don't have a prayer life. We don't have an anointing. We haven't prayed through in, in years. We haven't. We have not made a difference in church in a hundred years. We haven't impacted anybody's life. We're just taking up space on a pew, but we don't have the guts to admit it either. We do it all in the name of peace. You're not peaceful. You're just harmless. War is never convenient. It's never comfortable. It's never pleasant. But the message of Scripture says that it's required. War is necessary. When we forget how to make war, we fall under his influence. When one generation forgets how to make war, the future generations never learn how to make war. And sometimes we get this all mixed up. Saul was scared to death of the enemy, Goliath, but he had no problem throwing a spear at David. Man, we're that way in church. We don't know how to attack the devil. We don't know how to get the devil out of our house, but we'll come to, to church and attack the man of God for what he preached. We'll come to church and attack our brother and our sister for what they said, but we don't know how to attack the devil. We're scared, we're scared to death of him. 
Meanwhile, David had no fear of Goliath, but he was scared to death to raise his hand against God's anointed. Another hot topic today is active shooters. I had the pleasure of attending another class yesterday. Who remembers the school shooting in Florida, 2018, where the cops waited outside? I I remember that because I was still working for the... I think I just was leaving the sheriff's office or around that time. But anyway, I was still very familiar with the sheriff's office. And I want to give you a rundown of how that happened. That school had one SRO. That's normal. The SRO stands for school resource officer. In this case, it was a county deputy. But to his, on his staff, he had three security monitors. I like that title, security monitor. These security monitors were grown men. They wore a fancy shirt, and they just helped monitor the halls. And they had no authority. They had no weapons. I guess they had adult staff authority, but they were not law figures. Okay? They were just staff there for the purpose of monitoring and trying to keep things in order. The shooter had a reputation. He was so well known that they all had a nickname for him. He was known as Crazy Boy. If you mention the word Crazy Boy, they would know you're talking about him. Crazy Boy had such a reputation that before he was expelled from school, he was not allowed to bring any sort of backpack or bag or container at all. And if he wanted to come on campus, he personally had to subject himself to a search every time he came on campus. This is how hazardous of a student he was. They knew he was dangerous. Keep that in mind. That's important. Because they did eventually expel him. The next time they see him, the first security monitor sees him come in the gate carrying a rifle bag. The security monitor does nothing. He doesn't make a phone call. He doesn't tell the other security monitors. He does nothing. There's a boy named Crazy Boy that you didn't let come in with a bag. You didn't let him come in without a, a search. And he shows up with a Cabello's rifle bag. You know why he didn't say anything? Because he was scared of what was in the bag. The story's not over yet. The boy goes in the first floor and... At one in the hallway is the, the shooter. At the other in the hallway is the second security monitor. So then the boy goes into the stairwell here. The school has three stories. The security monitor goes up the other stairwell as if to catch, catch him off in the second floor. But the problem is the boy doesn't go up the second story. He just goes to the stairwell, and there he unloads it. He pulls out his gun, and now he starts to load it. If the first security monitor had stopped him, the gun was still unloaded and he could have been stopped quite easily. But as he's loading the gun, he ready to come out, a freshman kid comes in the stairwell and the shooter tells him, you better get out of here, it's about to get messy. These are security cameras showing these events. You see that boy booking out the door and he goes and he tells the SRO. The SRO, by the way, the second security monitor, does not make a phone call. Does not tell anybody that he saw a crazy boy with a rifle bag. Does not ask or communicate anything. The SRO does not tell anybody. He says, okay, I'm going to go check it out for myself. He wanted to go see what it was before he took this kid's word at it. As if he would make up this story for no reason. And what it... And as the security second monitor was going up to the second floor, the kid came back out, now loaded, and immediately started shooting kids. The second security monitor who had went up in the stairwell to catch him up on the second floor heard the shots, takes off running to the second floor, runs halfway in the hallway, goes in the janitor closet, locks the door. Security camera shows him hiding in the closet for the rest of the event. The third security monitor hears the gunshots, comes in just in time 
to get shot at the end of them. The SRO is making his way and he hears the gunshots. The kid killed 17 people on the first floor. And look, I don't want to alarm you, but uh, the kid, the shooter never went in the classrooms. Everyone he killed was from the doorway in the hallway. Just letting you know. He went up second, second floor and he went and shot and he didn't kill anybody. He just shot empty classrooms. Third floor, he found some other people. But in the meantime, the SRO recognizes the, the shots as gunshots, and he finally makes a radio call within the, the facility. We have gunshots in building 1,200. Stay back 500 feet. And he does not go in. He had all the, the kid made it to the third floor and killed another 18 people. He was told, at the time that he was told of the shooting, three people was, had died. At the time that he made it outside, eight people had died. He couldn't do nothing about the first three. He may could have saved some of the first eight, but we'll say he couldn't save the eight. But evidence was there. He could have saved everyone else after that had he went in. It was just one kid with one rifle that he obviously did not know how to shoot. He was not skilled at the gun. He constantly had to keep clearing it and unjamming it and was not using it properly. He could have been taken out quite easily. But he never went in. Nor did he let the other cops go in. He kept telling them, stay back, stay back, stay back. And that is why the sheriff's office and the school is being sued. Rightfully so. I bring that to your attention today to let you know that is exactly what we are doing as a church. We are watching our city fall apart. And we don't have the guts to intervene. We're watching our lives fall apart. And we don't have the guts to intervene. And we're doing it in the name of of comfort and peace. The devil is after your home. He's after your family. He's after your city. And I want to know, are you, are you being peaceful or are you just harmless? Society wants to tell you that 911 is the answer. 911 is not the answer. I don't blame the government for 911. It's the best they can do. But 911 is not the answer. It takes at least a certain amount of time before that operator gets enough communication from you that they understand what's going on. And then they have to transmit that to the authorities. And then they have to travel there. All the while, people are dying. But if somebody was in that facility would stand up and take action and say, I am tired of being harmless, I will do something about it. That, and studies have shown that is when lives are saved. And I'm not here to tell you to be some vigilante. I'm here to tell you to grow a backbone. Not just in the physical shooter world, but in the spiritual world. Grow a backbone. Start praying for people when you see them outside the pigwig. Start telling folks that need to come to church. Don't let them drink in front of you and, and act like it's okay. Say, excuse me, I don't want that. Stand up for yourself. Be an influence. Quit being harmless. This, everyone is depending on it. Someone has to stand up and take action. The spiritual equivalent of waiting on 911 is thinking it's my job to do it. I'll just come to church and let the pastor handle it. Well, I got news for you. When, if you're waiting on me to save this city, we're all going to burn. I'm not that talented. I'm doing the best I can. This is the best we can do. We got eight folks in here. This is the best I can do. We've got to have folks willing to stand up and say, I'm going to be there Wednesday. I'm going to be there Sunday. And I won't be by myself. I'm bringing somebody with me. And I'm going to make a difference in the city. I'm going to start praying with folks. I'm going to start teaching home Bible studies. I'm going to do something. Because I'm tired of being harmless. 
you're waiting on me, your family will suffer. We like to use our comfort zones as excuses. Brother Mike, I just don't have that kind of experience. I'm not good at that. It doesn't matter what you're good at. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter what you like to do. It doesn't matter what you want to do. It's a matter of souls spending eternity in hell. And I don't care if it makes your skin crawl. I don't care if it makes you pee your pants. you got to do what you have to do because your soul is worth it. Quit being cowardly. 2 Timothy 1 and 9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, not according to what I'm comfortable with, not according to what makes me feel good, not according to what does not embarrass me, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. I am sick of the excuses for not doing what God has called us to do. Satan is like a roaring lion. The Bible tells us that. He's seeking whom he may devour. Psychologists say that when they studied the psychopaths, and they asked them, they did a study, they took so many psychopaths, and they had the exact same list of victims, and they would show these people, tell us which one you would attack. The, psychopath, the different psychopaths all picked the same victims. Generally. A little difference here and there. But they generally pick the same people. And they ask why. They look easy. They teach you in, in gun classes to look like work. Don't look soft. Don't look easy. Don't look like a victim. You cannot be a guard dog with chihuahua skills. If you want to make a difference in this church in your home, in this community, you're going to actually have to do something about it besides just want it. You're going to have to do some spiritual push-ups. You're going to have to do some spiritual running. You're going to have to do some spiritual exercise and buff up and get to work. I heard a, a profound statement yesterday. People like to talk about how our schools and our churches just aren't safe anymore. And he said they were never safe. And that's true. They were never safe. The difference is they're just now being chosen as target places. The opportunity had always been there. Guns had always existed. Knives had always existed. Evil had always focused their efforts somewhere else, but now evil is focusing on shooting schools and churches. We can sit here like victims and cry about it, or we can do something about it and be victorious. I choose to be victorious. I don't want cowards. I don't like cowardice. I'm not asking you to be the best. I'm asking, asking you to do your best. Matthew 10 and 34, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Where did we get the idea that all violence is bad? Philippians 4 and 7, And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's wonderful. But to get that peace of God which passes all of, all of our understanding, to get that peace of God, we have to back up a few verses. Same chapter, Philippians 4, starting verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's that exercise that I told you about. It's not just going to happen. You're not going to just wake up one day and say, oh, the peace of God is in my mind. It's a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle. You don't just wake up one day able to push out 100 push-ups. You start out with small reps and you increase. Same thing spiritually.
If you've ever had to teach yourself how to do a pull-up, you start out just by hanging. If you cannot automatically pull yourself up, you start out just by hanging. You jump up and grab that bar, and you hold your body weight. And you pull the best you can. But just by hanging there, you are building the muscles necessary to pull yourself up. Just by hanging in there. But don't be happy with just one. All right, did one. You gotta learn to do two. Then you gotta learn to do three. This church is going, if we're going to grow, and I refuse to accept mediocrity, we're going to have to get off our rear ends and make it grow. And we cannot expect visitors to come in and do what we won't do and what we're not doing. So we have to make war with the devil. We have to make war with our flesh, make war with anything that comes against God's will. We cannot be at peace with his enemy. If anything is separating us from what he wants us to do, it is not a friend. That concludes my lesson today on the peaceful child of God. Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns today?